Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Ah, that was some nice, easy listening music to get us going. And I'm personally still reeling off of this morning's opening plenary. Um, wow, imagine like transporting to 2035 and then carrying that energy with us right here today to this stage and to this panel. Um, fair business um, for a fair world. And I want to say thank you to all the people who are here in the audience with us and the folks tuning in on live stream. Turn around and wave to those folks on the live stream. We're so happy you're here with us as well. Um, my name is Christopher Allen Nicholson. I am with B-Lab US and Canada, pronouns he, him. I've been with B-Lab US and Canada for uh, four years now, coming up on January, and I'm the Senior Manager of Strategy and Innovation, and I work on our annual strategic plan, bringing our theory of change to life and external partnerships as well. Um, we've got an incredible panel here with us today, um, bringing together some fair trade organizations uh, as well as companies um, who engage in fair trade certification throughout their supply chain. So. I want to ground us here in the fact that the theme of the retreat is humanity at work, right? And the values that come with that are interdependence, transparency, and you know, the pursuit of justice by centering those frontline communities. And our community, the B Corp community, is really about building that community of practice, which means being leaders and learners and creating a culture where behaviors and these values are commonplace. And the B Corp standards go really far and wide, and we also can look to other organizations like these fair trade certifications uh, to really go deep, to bring these companies um, throughout the supply chain the opportunity to go deep um, on the practices uh, that you know really, really matter. And consider impact on stakeholders all throughout the supply chain. And so B-Lab has been looking to these organizations and looking to partner with these organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think as we see the standards evolve over time and new requirements come about, we'll see this happen more often. And so here with us today, we have the three certifying organizations. I'm with B-Lab, and we also have Fair Trade America and Fair Trade USA. And with that, um, we also have two uh, incredible B Corps. Um, who engage with these fair, tra fair trade organizations, uh, Galant International and Divine Chocolates. And so with that, I am going to pass it to our panel to start doing some introductions. And the question is, introduce yourself, um, tell us a little bit about your organization, and then also, uh, how does your heart show up in this work? And yeah, we'll kick it off with Abby. All right, thank you so much for having me. I'm Abby Ayers. I lead retail and food service partnerships at Fairtrade USA, which means I have the privilege of working with some of the largest retailers, food service distributors, and companies around the globe to really think about how they might leverage fair trade practices and integrate them within their own strategy setting sustainability commitments, responsible sourcing policies, and really lifting up the opportunity to allow their customers to vote with their dollar and live their values through their purchases. Um, at Fairtrade USA, we're building an innovative model of responsible businesses, conscious consumerism, and shared value to eliminate poverty and to enable sustainable production for fishers, workers, and producers all around the globe. Um, how my heart shows up in this work. Um, you know, the values of Fair Trade USA that's really led us for the last 25 years of fairness, transformation, integrity, impact, and community, it's really um, allowed us to innovate the principles of fair trade to be able to bring more people in more industries, in more places into the movement. And I actually started my career in grocery retail, um, where I developed a private label organic product line 12 years ago. And we realized in order to mainstream a brand, we needed to also align ourselves with something more than just organic that consumers could trust. And so fair trade was that. And that 
you know, um, gave not just me and my team, but us as a company real purpose to see that we were living our values and in, in offering up affordable organic products, but that also drove real change and impact into producers' lives. So I'm really proud of the work we've been able to do over the last decade, um, but si last six years at Fair Trade. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vic Kiri. I'm the founder of Gallant International Inc. Uh, I was born and raised in Nepal. Uh, right now, we live in California. And we work with uh, 700 plus farmers uh, in India and, and with fair trade certified factories. So we help uh, corporates, uh, brands, celebrities, nonprofits on their sustainable journey by supplying 100% organic and fair trade certified cotton products. Uh, last year, we helped um, 700 plus farmers to certify regenerative organic practices, which is the next big deal, and I'll be talking, I have another session that will go uh, more in detail in that. Um, you know, I mean, it's rewarding. You know, when I was uh, growing up, I didn't have anything be very honest, we had no running water, no access to road, you know, no access to good food. Um, and, you know, learning about organic, learning about fair trade, learning about um, regenerative and, and, and what B Corp is doing. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's giving, has given me opportunity to practice those standards and values and make a business, make money, and also help those farmers and workers and, and grow. It's, it's why I'm here and, and I, all, I will always be there. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Troy. Hey, good morning, guys. My name is Troy Pearlie. I'm with Divine Chocolate USA. I'm the executive VP general manager. And um, Divine Chocolate is the only premium chocolate company that's fair trade and B Corp certified and farmer owned. So we basically challenge the business models uh, as y'all guys know, because y'all guys are interested in planet and people, commodity farmers are typically uh, the lowest one on, on the chain in terms of having the opportunity to provide for themselves, the manufacturers, the transportation companies, the brands, everybody else makes money in the process. So the farmer ownership uh, model is how we're challenging, you know, um, business models in, in general, which is pretty cool. Um, we also invest 2% of our total turnover uh, to pharma community programs, where we invest in the community programs and do a lot of cool things in uh, West Africa. Kuapa Coco is, is the pharma organization that owns 20% of Divine Chocolate, and I've had the privilege to work with them um, uh, for the past 10 years. I just recently um, had my 10 year anniversary at Divine, so that's pretty cool. Um, coming from a, I would say a traditional corporate America background like myself because I've had the opportunity to work for Fortune 100 companies. This is the most challenging work that I've ever, you know, participated in, but it's also the most meaningful work. And I'll say I'm, I'm proud that Divine Chocolate's Fair Trade certified, and I'm proud that, you know, we, we B Corp, uh, best for the world, but Fair Trade and B Corp is just a prerequisite. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and I challenge everybody in this room to get on the journey and let's, let's just change the world and make it a better place. Hi everyone, my name is, my name is Carlos Urmaneta. Um, I work for Fairtrade America. Fairtrade America is the US branch for the Fairtrade International System. The Fairtrade, uh, we're comprised of uh, a network of two mil, over two million farmers and workers uh, worldwide, um, you know, numerous supporters and advocates, uh, over 2,500 businesses buying and selling products with a fair trade mark. Uh, today we have over 37,000 products carrying the fair trade mark and across the world, uh, across 100 countries. So um, we're considered, you know, one of the top um, ethical certifications in the world. So I'm very proud to be working with Fairtrade uh, and representing here today. Um, to share a little bit of our, gui our guiding principles, number, uh, firstly is that we're producer-led. Everything we do is, is designed and thought 
having producers at the center. Uh, we're human-centered, and um, this shows in the way we operate, 50%. Um, the, the producers have 50% of the vote on our General Assembly, so this means that they have a voice and they have a vote at the table, and they make the most important decisions when it comes to standard revision, when it comes to strategy, um, and all the important decisions that are within the fair trade system. We also have a network of um, producer networks that support the producer organizations around the world. We have one in Latin America and the Caribbean, one in Asia Pacific, and also uh, one for Africa, and we have around 265 staff on the ground. The second, large, the second uh, guiding principle is that we're market-based. So rather than aid, we, we focus on trade, making trade fair. Uh, the way we do this is that we, we have a standard that uh, organizations can comply and producers and traders can comply and brands. But also we do a lot of work beyond certification and this is to create an enabling environment that allows uh, fairer trading conditions and allows uh, com um, communities and, and farmer organizations to thrive within their communities. And lastly, context matters. Like I said, everything we do, it's around producers, and producers um, work within very unique contexts and their commodities. We, you know, we, we, each commodity is very unique, and every geography has its own political ecologies and unique conditions, so we consider these when we're designing programs, when we're revising the standard, and when we think about just anything that's going to affect producers, we, we work very closely with them to get these uh, moving forward. So that's the only way we can really assure uh, an important level of impact and scale and, bought and, and that everybody's bought in across the, the, the food system. And then just a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Honduras, so I, I, I was born and raised in there. I grew up in an agricultural family, first bananas and then uh, coffee. I see some Hondurans in the crowd. <laughs> So, um, so this work is very close to my heart, and uh, I've, I've worked there um, most of my life, and now I get to be in this unique position when I'm working, I'm working with the market, with consumers, with uh, stakeholders that make the very you know, critical decisions to put these products in front of consumers. So I'm really looking forward to all the connections that we're going to make here today and, and just the, the, all the future work that's ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. Yes, give it a round of applause for these four incredible organizations. I'm sitting here and I'm already learning so much um, and just thinking about um, how this work seems really complex, but at the heart of it, it's so simple. Um, it is about humanity uh, and centering those human values. And grounding, I heard a couple of times we're talking about um, frontline communities and we're talking about uh, inequality and we're talking about fair wages. And I, I don't want to shy around this. Our current reality is we have outsized inequality in our economic system, and there is increasing profit for a few, um, but then those who are producing the raw materials and goods often are left with the leftovers. Um, we don't need another news headline to remind us that we're in a climate emergency and that there are many communities, frontline communities, who are facing the most adverse risks and have been facing impacts of the climate emergency. And so I don't say this at all to be doom and gloom because I'm an optimist, um, but I think that we can look to these folks up here on stage as we're going through uh, this panel um, as leaders and as learners. So follow that curiosity and use this panel as a reminder that the solutions do exist um, and that we have examples right here uh, on stage in progress. So with that, we are going to kick it off with our first question, uh, and that is, how have you seen the landscape and receptiveness of the fair trade movement change over time? And this is for anyone uh, on stage. Um, and think about these contexts of COVID-19, the climate emergency, other challenges that are cropping up in the world. Um, how have these impacted the fair trade movement? Um, and especially, you know, in your experience of working with farmers and frontline communities and, and producers? Well, it's, it's pretty um, interesting um, how the landscape has changed because uh, as a result of the Great Reset, or COVID as y'all guys call it, um, people began to look inward and started to question a lot of things. You had a lot of time on your hands. Um, so uh, for us, we see that consumers are really interested in what they're buying and how they're making their purchases and how they're spending their money. 
So that basically has amplified a fair trade position, B cost position um, from my vantage point. Ironically, um, during COVID, uh, at least with Coopa, COVID was managed quite well because the farms are spread out. And you know, I'm, I'm a New York City guy, so it was just total chaos. It was a ghost town in New York. And uh, the Zoom calls that I had with Don, everybody's smiling and talking, and I'm like, can I come there? <laughs> you know, like, what's going on? So they were able to manage COVID pretty well, thank God. But um, I, I think as a result of COVID, um, consumers' perspectives uh, have changed. They're, they're more intrigued with what they're buying. They're more intrigued with what they're putting in their body. And that, that has bode well for Divine being an all-natural brand, a fair trade brand. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good point. Um, it's also an interesting time because as consumers are becoming more aware, they're also putting more responsibility on the businesses and the brands with the products they purchase. They have a higher level of expectation and they're expecting us as brands to live up to that expectation. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing really that being led by millennials and Gen X who have the, the highest buying power in North America and will continue to have that. And they, those generations also are the most socially aware and climate conscious that we've ever seen. And so I think we have a real opportunity to leverage pe the questioning of our consumers with what we offer them as a product. Um, I, I think as it pertains to farmers, you know, they were equipped as far as outdoor work and, you know, being spread out. Um, but COVID really did, it was devastating to farmers as well. You had not just loss of life, but vanishing resources. Um, and so I'm actually really impressed and proud of what we've been able to, to do as as he was saying, through fair trade, because we were able to really quickly provide guidance and resources um, that were so necessary that weren't being provided by government, for example. Um, and we saw from looking back at the data that our fair trade farms and factories were so well equipped to deal with these devastating kind of occurrences like the pandemic and and the climate crisis, many of them were the first factories to reopen after the pandemic, and they saw return to work rates higher than any other farm and factory. That's uh, awesome. And I echo um, Troy and uh, Abby. Uh, I work directly with uh, farmers in India, uh, and I do only organic cotton. I'm not in food or beauty products. Until 2018, we're paying 30% more for our organic cotton than any other organic cotton products buyer. But after COVID, they are demanding 30% more because there is so much demand of organic cotton and there is no enough organic cotton. Right now, I just came back from India about a week ago. Farmers are holding their cotton. They are not giving. They are asking more than 30% of MSP price, right? So for farmers, in fact, it did wonderful because like as you, you know, Troy said, and you said, people are sitting at home. You know, where do, want, where do I want to spend my money? Do I want to just buy crappy thing or I want to do something with social good, something helping, you know, people, farmers, right? So that is tremendous. I mean, that's, I'm so proud to inform that, you know. I mean, there is, there's so much benefits to organic cotton but still, only 1% of the entire cotton growth is organic cotton. People are, you know, the big companies are not investing enough, despite the fact they know that it, has, it does a lot of, you know, good stuff. For example, it uses 88% less water and 60% less energy, right? But now this is going to change. I saw this on the ground, big company employing, um, uh, agencies to try to certify farms. So this has really, really helped. Okay, so it's, it's and, and regarding uh, factory, um, I work with only fair trade certified factories, and my partner factory uh, during COVID, uh, when it was locked down, uh, he has almost 5,000 workers, right? And uh, so we partner with our bags and t-shirts. 
So he paid 50% salary to entire their workers. Whereas other non fair trade certified factories, they were closed down, workers were sent, they didn't get any benefits, and, um, and they're not returning to work. Even if they are returning, they are starting from, you know, you know, zero now again, because, you know, they are not going to get as much as they were making before, right? And those factories, they are still not opening. But whereas, you know, fair trade certified factories, they open right away. 100% people return, right? And the factory I work with, fair trade certified factory, has 99% employee retention rate. 99%, including management. So fair trade works, uh, definitely works. I have seen gallant growth you know, over the last few years. It's tremendous. We're growing you know, very rapidly. And also I know a lot of uh, brands who sell uh, fair trade certified products, and they are growing very well as well. So I think people are watching, like you, know, you said, consumers. They want to buy the stuff that has some values, not just profit for the company. Um, so that's my thing. I don't know if I cover it, everything. Um, so let's see. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Vic. Yeah, thank you. Carlos, do you have anything to add? We've got a, f a sure. full, full context here, but yeah, anything else to add? Yeah, maybe a little bit uh, something uh, of a unique perspective from me from you know, living and, and, and growing up in a producing country. It's just crazy to see where we are today, what the panelists have shared today, where we are. Um, now people are bought into the benefits and the impact that fair trade and sustainability brings, but it was, it was not always like that. And this has happened only in the past, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, I remember, you know, growing up around the banana plantations where United Fruit Company had their large scale operations in Honduras. And if we look back, uh, that agriculture back then would not be up to today's standards anywhere close to being sustainable. Um, and then I had my first experience working in ag in South America. I was working in in the cotton plantations in Paraguay and Brazil. And I remember just being like taken aback by seeing just vast lands of uh, thousands of hectares just being defore like deforestation being cleared to grow soybean, to grow cotton. And, and people, you know, had jobs, development was, was present, but at a very high cost. So luckily I had the opportunity to, to, to work in sustainable coffees uh, soon after. And that's when I discovered fair trade for the same time. This was like around 20 years ago. And I remember coming to, I worked for a private uh, sector multinational and I was in charge of starting the certification program, which was, n it, it didn't exist. And I told my colleagues, hey, check out these guys from fair trade, what they're doing. And they're like, ooh, I don't know about that. <laughs> like, why, what's going on? It's like, no, oh, fair trade, you gotta be careful because, you know, they, they like to get organized. They like to get the farmers to get organized. And it's like taboo, right? And then they're like, and they also, it doesn't matter if the market goes down, we have to pay a minimum price. Imagine that. And then on top of that, we got to pay a premium. We can't be messing with that. So just focus on these other certifications. You know, they're more friendly. They're easier. Let's work with them. And... It was just, I didn't comprehend it at the time, but then just, just see how, how far we've come, you know, that everybody's bought in. We're sitting here discussing how we, we can collaborate, multiple actors in the private sector at all levels, you know, across uh, between certifications. I think there's tremendous potential there. And um, I think the US is a little bit, and North America is a little bit lagging compared to the rest of the world. But um, we're seeing how the, the brand, the recognition for, the, for B Corp and, and fair trade is, is really uh, growing. So I think there's, um, there's some good things, but there's a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really good um, point. Carlos was saying earlier that you know, fair trade is farmer focused and market led. Um, you know, what you were saying, Carlos, about before like the skepticism of paying a cost and people saw fair trade and a lot of certifications as a cost and as an investment. You know, I'm really excited because through this pandemic, um, as more and more consumers are asking for fair trade products or sustainably sourced products, it's, um, you know, really requiring businesses to look at it where before they really weren't as open to it. 
and looking at it even more critically. So looking at the business case, when it's really what led me to fair trade, because when I launched a brand with fair trade, I really did it to appeal to a certain type of consumer. But as I started to look at the actual business case, it's not just good for producers, it's also good for business. I saw tangible business results that was the business case, and that's what inspired me to come to fair trade and to support other businesses to do the same. I would say, you know, my real call to action for all of us is as you do good, as you set sustainability commitments and goals, as you move towards certification, you know, celebrate that, but also be really critical and look at the, the business results you're getting from it and the value, not just to the bottom line, but throughout the supply chain of, you know, we all have decisions to make for our businesses and we all, of course, need to stay viable, um, but looking at the business results can drive real change and looking through the results, like Vic was saying about retention. I mean, labor is our, one of our number one cost drivers. And so if we can prove retention or recruitment, um, you know, that's a huge cost savings. And so there is tangible value to these programs and to caring about people throughout your supply chain. I love that you're looking at that from really both lenses um, of the, the market driven and the, the producer driven uh, as, as well. Um, we have data from a recent uh, market survey that we did with, with B-Lab in partnership with Forbes Marsh Group, uh, a B Corp, and uh, we learned that consumers are two and a half times more loyal to companies that integrate value throughout their supply chain, uh, and 64% of adults in the US and 69% in Canada believe consumers can impact social and political change uh, through their purchases. Um, and I think a big reason for that is because there is trust behind these labels. Um, and then there's trust because there's credibility in the standards that are a, a roadmap for businesses. Um, and so I'm curious with, with that lens of things um, for, for both of our companies up here on stage, when you're looking at you know, uh, integrating fair trade and uh, having your product certified as, as fair trade, when you're going about that process, is that something you start and you say, oh great, we've checked all the boxes, we're ready, we're ready to go, or were your company having to make changes um, even at the onset in, in kind of looking at those standards to say, oh hey, we've got some work to do. We've, yeah, how, how long did that process take from start to finish and, and what did it look like from a, a business transformation perspective? So, you know, first up, regarding business, right? Because business has to make profit uh, so that you can make an impact, you can be more generous, you can be more giving, whether it's your family or your farmers who grow your cotton or any produce or your factory workers, right? So I started my business from swap meet in Warren's County, California, right? And uh, until I, you know, until we certify to fair trade standards, and organic standards, uh, I was struggling. I had $80,000 uh, credit card, you know, loan, then I had like from family friends, almost $250,000. Uh, I used to do a lot of shows and, and somebody told me that Vic, uh, you seem to be trying to do good, helping you know, people in India and this, but unless you are certified, how people are going to believe, you need to have some third party certification, right? And today, Gallant proudly you know, says that we work with more than 450 companies and celebrities and, and nonprofits from small to biggest. We just signed a contract with a company called Mina Lima. They make uh, the design and make uh, Harry Potter merchandise. Uh, Apple came and waited. We are supplying to Apple, uh, Microsoft, Google, all these tech companies, they are coming to us, not because I'm handsome, because, you know, because they see that certification. Gallant produces organic cotton, it's got certified. Gallant source uh, fair trade cotton from fair trade certified uh, uh, farms. Uh, Gallant makes products at fair trade certified factory and Gallant is a big work certified, right? So this is all help and in my wildest dream that I never thought I would be sitting on this stage and talking about this. And this is all because of this certification, and this is my experience. Unless you are certified by third party, there is no nothing. I can say anything, right? So, 
So that's the thing. Then, you know, like when we started making business, then so what, like regarding fair trade uh, factory, uh, Abby can say more, but in order to sell certified products, you have to buy from fair trade, fair trade certified factory, right? Or you have to nominate a factory. Uh, so I did research and, and because of my connection and all that. So I knew, I met a gentleman, he was doing garments and home goods, uh, you know, making for many sustainable brands, um, fair trade certified products. So I went to him, I said, you know, I, I can bring in a business. They set up a bag factory and, and he did, right? So then I knew that he was sourcing, he was supporting 10,800 farmers, uh, fair trade certified farmers in India, right? So I didn't have enough money, capital to go directly. Then once I started making money, some profit, I started, okay, now I want to go to directly farmers, I want to help them pre-finance organic cotton seeds, right? Because a lot of farmers don't practice organic because there is no enough organic cotton seeds in the market, right? So we started doing that. Then we made a little bit more money, right? And we said, okay, let me do regenerative organic certified now. We want to go to the next level, right? So now I'm working on different solar projects and other things because customers who value this product help me do this, right? So this is how I'm incorporating every profit we are making, we are investing, we are bringing this story, farmers and workers are benefited, right? And Gallant is also growing. So definitely I vote for it. I'm lifetime, <laughs> you know, Patriot, uh, you know, what do you call certified products advocate. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. How about you, Troy? Um, especially like in terms of like product development, you, you want your product to be approachable from a retail standpoint, but the key decision makers is that the retailers are understanding that premium products come out of premium retail. Um, they're using terms like better for you now, which gives us a foot up. So they understand that the retails are gonna be a little bit higher because it's an all natural product. And because of the certifications, non-GMO, uh, V Corp, fair trade. Um, but we would like to think at Divine that our products are affordable luxuries. We're not asking you to go out and buy a house or take a loan. You just buy a chocolate bar for a ridiculous price and everybody's happy, you help the farmers and it's good for the planet and everything. Um, but I, I think the entire mindset, like we said earlier, has evolved in terms of understanding on why these products are at a premium price. Um, you're buying products that has transparency in the supply chain and all of, the, all of these things. And with the cancel culture that we live in today, none of these retailers want to get caught with their pants down, so to speak. They want to partner with sustainable brands that are doing great things. So I think that it's really a good space to be in right now. Yeah, I agree. That's great to hear. It, and I think for, for folks you know, who don't have the context, it's B Corp certification is the whole company certification, whereas fair trade uh, is about the products and, and the materials. Uh, and so they go hand in hand and being fair trade certified by either organization actually gets you credit on the BM impact assessment. So that's something great to keep in mind. Um, and I want to get down to, so you, you have the standards, you have um, the, the requirements, the connecting with producers, and, and there's already, you know, factories and, and producers who are, are certified, but I've heard a few of you talk about relationships with producers themselves. Um, and so maybe, Carlos, I, I heard you talking about your, your producer council and, and the, the folks who can have a voice in creating the standards. I would love to hear from, from you and other panelists um, how do you connect with those producers and the suppliers and the farmers and the frontline communities um, and really from that justice-centered lens? So making sure their voice is not just heard in the process but a decision maker in the process. Yeah, so, so this is, I think, one of the fundamental principles of, of fair trade and the fair trade movement is this, this power of the collective um, from the cooperative level and the association, the producer organizations, they need to be you know, working together. That's the only way that they're gonna be competitive. That's the only way that they're gonna be able to combat the economies of scale. They're gonna be able to get a, a fair, fair deal is if they, if they negotiate and they come in as a, as a united front. 
and then that transfers into the way that fair trade as a movement uh, operates. You know, we have, um, I, I described a little bit about the, the global network, but that is supported by, by this um, producers, we call them producer networks, which are actually support networks. Uh, almost 300 staff on the ground, um, staying connected with everyone. So really scanning and trying to understand, you know, things that happen on the ground that are rapidly changing, being adaptive, that then we are constantly in contact with them. We look at markets, we look at climate events. You know, for COVID, we deployed, um, seven, we were able to leverage $17 million for a producer resilience and, and support fund. Um, and this was with support with partners, but we were able to deploy that quickly. Also, a lot of our partners and brands that are working with us, such as Divine and Gallant, they, uh, if they're interested in doing you know, deforestation projects, if they're trying to do beyond sourcing, beyond certification, fair trade should be the minimum that anybody should do. For companies, B Corp should be the minimum. It should be the standard. So this is what's expected, but in order to really move the needle, we need to go beyond. And the only way that we can do that is going beyond certification. So these producer projects that actually can um, shift and transform how business is done, going beyond business as usual, that's the only way that we're really gonna reach the impact that we need. So that connection to farmers and the communities, it's critical. And of course, at the leadership level, you know, our global CEO is based in Kenya, she's African. You know, we're, we're very proud of her work. She's advocating for, for fair trade in the system. You know, right now she was at COP27 with a group of producers with, you know, presenting their voice and, and trying to influence decision makers and, and, you know, what fundamentally needs to change at the political level as well. So uh, that's really the, the work that we're doing and we're very proud of it. You should be proud of it. And I think it's all, like, like we've been saying, very relationship focused and that's we've seen all throughout the pandemic um, how important relationships are uh, in promoting resilience in general. And so, yeah, we'd love to, to take that question also to anyone else on the panel who wants to speak to it. Yeah, I'm happy to. I think, like Carlos explained, our model is entirely based on dialogue, transparency, and respect. And so that means that we have a responsibility to have near constant communication with our workers, our fishers, our producers, but also our businesses to ensure that what we're trying to do with fair trade is working throughout the supply chain and in driving the intended, intended outcomes. Um, one thing that I'll add is, you know, one thing we're really focused on is how do we build relationships and maintain that two-way dialogue, not just through our field staff on the ground who work day to day with our producers, but also in this remote world we live in, which, um, you know, COVID really made necessary. And so we're investing a lot in technology, both from, you know, collecting feedback, innovating the model, um, but also being able to, it's, it's not just about the standard, it's also about, you know, trainings and, and human development, business development, capacity building, um, and I think one of the powerful things of Fair Trade is that we are bringing people together. At Fair Trade USA, we work with all sorts of entities. They don't have to be legal cooperatives, but they can also be independent smallholders or um, fishers. But the power of bringing people together collectively, not just to be able to share ideas, but also to have you know, critical mass to be able to export in the global marketplace and get the best price for their goods, is also this sharing of ideas globally of this producer network who is part of the system and be able, being able to really learn and leverage from you know, fishermen in Alaska to learn from you know, produce so, um, produce growers in South Africa, like there's a lot that we can all learn from each other, which we as consumers have learned through the pandemic. And I think that's one of the most powerful pieces of fair trade is that ability to bring people together. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, Chris touched about uh, traceability. Uh, again, I mean, no offense, um, having Fair trade certified, having B Corp certified, 
having org organic certifies, these are the basic things, and like as you said, should be norm. But people want more than that. They want traceability. They want to know, yes, you are a B Corp certified, but where do you make your products? How you are connected to those farmers or workers or producers, right? Now, any company, big company you want to work with, like, you know, now, as I said, Gallant is growing. We're getting big inquiries from big, big corporations. They want to know the traceability and transparency to the last miles, right? So this is very important that you have to connect with your supplier, no matter what, right? Not every company or a startup has that opportunity to go and work directly with farmers uh, because, you know, you have to invest, right? It took many years for me to do that, right? So my suggestion for you, if you are a small company or if you are starting, first find out fair trade certified factory, fair trade certified farmers, right? If you cannot go to direct farmers, find out, for example, like who is making products for Patagonia, which factory? Or which factory is making shoes for Tom's, right? They don't make, they are not exclusive factories. They make products for different brands. So you go to them, tell them, I want to make this product. My order will be small. I'm still small, right? But I'm willing to pay premium for that because, you know, they're not going to entertain you um, unless you are willing to pay some upcharge for your MOQ, right? Then there you ask them, where do you source your products? They have to give, see for us, like uh, God certified, we have to give traceability like all the way, like where the ginning was done, where the weaving was, uh, yarn was made, where weaving is done, which factory the product was made, right? Now all the, which transportation we use, it came by air, by ocean, and all these things, right? So to connect again, you know, again, my humble opinion, I'm just learning, it's very beginner, try to find those companies that are already doing, if you are a startup or new, from there, you get that traceability, you know, and you connect with them. Fine, maybe you are not making contribution directly, right? But at least you can go and meet with them, learn about them. And when you grow, you make additional impact, you know, just beside premium and other things. As so many can. And, I mean, see, I mean, it's, 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 I should not be saying this. Google and Facebook are my clients, okay? But your story that you bring, having connection with your farmers, your workers, is much more powerful than paying on those paper clicks, advertising on Facebook and, uh, uh, you know, Google, because there you are just paying, you are trying to sell. Whereas here, you are trying to bring story, take it to the clients, and they become your loyal clients. You see? So I, 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 that's my suggestion. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, thank you. Anything to add, Troy? Well, I mean, in terms of relationships and being able to uh, leverage relationships, I have an opportunity to work at Divine Chocolate that's partially, for, you know, co-owned by farmers uh, and being fair trade certified, we were able to do an agroforestry program um, and build some trees, plant some trees and that yield some positive results in terms of revitalization in the soil and, you know, um, potential source of food and just do a little things above and beyond fair trade. Um, as, as we know, these commodity farmers live in challenging conditions, so it, it's great to have these relationships with fair trade and being able to speak to Kawapa directly and get guidance from them um, to address some of the things uh, that they need to be addressed. You know, we, for example, for years since I've been here for 10 years, uh, we have, we've worked in conjunction with Kawapa with a l literacy program um, that's just phenomenal. I mean, one year I was uh, in Ghana and I was uh, at one of the classes and a, a woman was talking and it's, it's funny how things work and it was just a candid conversation, unscripted. And one woman was like, um, you know, it's great. I get, I get on the bus now and I actually can read a sign and I know the name of the sign. I don't have to look for landmarks and, um, f you know, from where I have to get off at now. I'm able to just look at signs and I'm like, wow, that's really empowering. And it was kind of disarming to me, you know, being an arrogant American, I guess. I'm like, because this woman was old enough to be my mom. So it was just really great to see that we're able to make an impact in these communities because similar to my household, 85% of Ghanaian women run the house. So this woman needs to be able to read. Um, another woman said something to the effect like, uh, it's okay to be a mother. I love to be a mother. 
but you don't need to be a teenage mother. I tell this to my daughter. So the whole thought process and, and the evolution of literacy, how it just changed the mindset of people. So these relationships are really great relationships and you know, we're doing some meaningful work, which is pretty cool. That's really great to hear because it puts some context into the outcome of all of the hard work that goes into thinking about fair trade um, and integrating fair trade certified materials into your supply chain. I think a lot of businesses might, you know, go to a website and look at standards, and they do this with B Lab and B Corp standards as, as well, and say, "Oh my gosh, this is a lot. This is going to take a lot of time, but the payoff is worth it um, in the impact that that has on the people." in your supply chain um, and, and the people who you're doing business with every day. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna move to uh, open Q&A in just a moment, but I have one more question here um, for, for anyone on the panel. Um, and this is just a, kind of a general question of what is the best way for either an individual or consumer um, or, uh, I know Vic, earlier you spoke to a business, what's the best way for a business to get involved um, in the fair trade movement? Uh, so any of those angles um, from the individual consumer perspective or if a business is saying, yeah, I'm inspired by this, I wanna get involved, um, how should they show up, where should they go, et cetera? I think the easiest answer as a consumer is obviously to seek out and purchase fair trade products. Um, as a business, we have the ability to leverage our purchasing power to do the same. So. You know, one thing about fair trade is that there, once we certify a farm, a fishery, a factory, anything leaving that farm, fishery, or factory can be sold as fair trade, but it's not actually a very small percentage of goods is actually sold as fair trade, meaning it's labeled and someone is paying the community development premium and validating the supply chain. And so as a business, you know, you have the opportunity to just look at your purchasing power. The brands, you know, we all serve coffee or have tea. Um, you know, instead selecting fair trade coffee or tea, seeking out ingredients that are certified. Often the suppliers you're already buying from have that um, availability for you and it doesn't really require any additional work other than agreeing to purchase as fair trade. So I think that would be my, my call to action as consumers seek out Fair trade products everywhere you shop, not just at grocery stores, but you know the avocados at Sweet Green, um, or stopping into a convenience store and getting a quick coffee. And as businesses, really being critical of your supply chain and making sourcing policies and commitments that you can celebrate with your associates. Yeah, that was that was really good. Thanks for. Uh for putting it that way, Abby, I, I agree with you and I wanna build on that. Um, I wanna speak to the folks that are here and that are watching us through um, in their homes. I think that you have the, the power and the influence to really shift the, the power dynamics here. I think that um, you have that power within yourself, those human, human values that drive your businesses and how your businesses influence other businesses. So it's a chain. So I think you have a unique opportunity to really be part of that transformation. Be part of that transformation that I was talking about earlier. Um, if you're a B Corp uh, certified company, I would advise that you reach out to any of the fair trades, talk to us, do your due diligence, see you know, how our values align depends on what it's a priority for you, but just know that as supply chain um, transparency becomes a bigger um, requirement and an issue globally, uh, just to get into a supermarket in Europe or any other part of the world, you're gonna, you're gonna have to be talking about human rights and environmental due diligence, supply chain transparency, what Vic was saying about you know, tier one, two, and three, outsource small and medium enterprises. You can't just say, oh, I, I outsource that can't get away with that anymore. So um, I think just uh, look at fair trade certification and, and I would love to, to have a conversation after this with B Corp because in my, in my experience working with sustainable supply chains, I've seen some, some tremendous benefit that can come from interoperability among certifications. So how can we make it seamless for a B Corp certified company to certify their supply chain all the way to the last mile 
or the beginning of their, their sourcing journey um, at farm level. So I think those are a, a lot, of, this is just the start of the conversation, but there's a lot more work to be done. And um, yeah, thanks so much for this opportunity and looking forward to chatting with you all. Thanks, Carlos. Like I said, follow that curiosity, even if there's a seed there and you're like, ah, oh, I wanna learn more. Like I said, we have incredible people who have gone through this journey already and are you know, deeper along on their, on their journey. And so um, Vic or, or Troy, if you wanna speak to any like one piece of advice you would have for a business who's starting on their, their fair trade journey, um, what would it be? Yeah, you wanna go pot? Um, it's a journey and I think that's the, the, the word, that's a great word to use is a journey. This is not, um, a ready mix process. Uh, this is something that you, you want to be invested in for long term results and impact doesn't, is not going to be immediate impact. It's, you know, you're going to have to invest time and resources. But again, like I said in, in the opening comments, it's, it's meaningful work. Um, and you know, you, you'll, you'll be pleased when you see consumers making these small choices on the shelf that's making a really a big impact. Uh, with, the, with the producers that you're working with. But it's a journey. Um, awesome. <clears throat> I think uh, connectivity, right? Connecting with your suppliers um, is the main thing. Like a lot of uh, fast fashion brands, they have buyers sitting in New York or Philadelphia or LA. They have buying houses in Hong Kong. They are making products in Bangladesh. They know nothing about the workers. They know nothing how much they are paying, how they are treated, you know, their working condition, collapsing buildings, fires. But if you connect, you go, you see, you visit, then you can come here and sit here with confidence and say, Do you know what? My workers are taken care of, our farmers are paid fair wages. Right? I, I, I think that's, that's very important. So again, you know, to start this, you know, if, if you are a business person, if you are, if you are uh, planning to do business, you know, again, as I said, go with the factories or the farmers, the producers, uh, who are already supporting this when you are new, then you make bigger contribution when your business grows. But again, as I said, business will grow. If you do good, it's going to come back to you. It's called karma, right? If you do good, it's come back to you. And I've seen it, I've seen at least 20 to 30 brands that I work closely with, they are growing, right? So that's my suggestion. I don't know if that's good enough. Or <laughs> that, is, that is an incredible way to end our, our uh, set of prepared questions. And I think the theme I'm getting here is slow down. Whether you're a consumer or whether you're a business, it's that take the breath. Look at your supply chain. Look at your consumer purchase choices. And I think one of the tenets of capitalism that has had us at the grip for a really long time is this urgency and this speed and uh, being able to slow down and put that breath in it, put those relationships in it is, is really beautiful. Uh, one more thing, like collectively, you, know, you may be making very small contribution, but collectively we can do a lot. Maybe Abby can say how much premium was raised so far uh, to the, you know, that went to farmers and workers and all that, maybe that billion dollar Mark, you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. I think like we, we have a really big um, celebration this year. We're hitting a billion dollars in premium that's gone back to producers, and that means additional yeah. income. <laughs> yeah, that means additional income, but that also means in projects, and it's not like uh, Carlos and Troy were saying aid. We spend as Americans trillions of dollars of aid. We know. Um, but this is in earned money by producers that they're able to then take and identify their own problems and come up with creative solutions the way they see fit. And it's that model of empowerment that's the intangible, immeasurable piece of fair trade that we hope and know and think will drive um, an end to systemic poverty. So we're really thankful for all of you that continue to support us and for just being here and your interest in, in hearing about how you might leverage or think about fair trade or fair trade principles in your, in your businesses. Okay, another big round of applause for that. That is a big, big celebration. 
All right. I think we might have time for one or two questions, a few questions. Um, I'm not sure what the mic situation is, if we have another roaming mic um, that we can give folks. I see lots of hands cropping up, so I'm going to go, yeah, Brianna, you can, you can do the choosing. First off, thank you so much to each of you. Your perspectives and your um, professional background and experiences really help educate us uh, to um, understand, learn, and continue doing like the self-investigation of truth is what I call it personally. So as a, uh, as a young woman who's really uh, tried my best to eat um, organically, I've built relationships with farmers and I go to farmers markets only. Uh, the reason for that is, is because I've had trouble trusting labels. No offense to fair trade or anyone. I, I just, there's oftentimes articles will come up where they're not actually operating ethically. Um, uh, and it's, it's just frustrating. And another thing I recently did in the last two years was just go completely eating fruits and veggies, <laughs> just removes the potential um, issues with sustainability at large. I was just curious on a personal level, uh, aside from the fact that when I do go to a grocery store, I go to a B Corp uh, grocery store only. So those are like the things I do wherever I lived. And I've lived both in the States and in Europe as well. My question for each of you or whoever like to answer on a personal level, uh, how do you, what's the best um, step forward when you're struggling with trusting labels and, and trusting these certifications that are being done ethically and that the farmers are being treated well and that the food is, is what they say it is and all, the, like all those, it's multi-layered, I, I am sure you guys know in your work. It just how do you manage that on a, on a moral level and ethically uh, in your personal lives? Well, well, you don't. First of all, you're very courageous to say that because uh, the inside joke at Divine Chocolate is when you pick up a package, it looks like you're looking at a race car driver with all the patches. <laughs> and it's very difficult to um, navigate through that. And the shelf is very busy with duplication versus variety. Um, so there's, there's not a short answer. I will say this much. I, I would caution you. Um, with dealing with brands that are evaluating themselves that have their own um, models. You don't let the inmates run the prisons. So that, that would be one. And two, fair trade, like I believe in third party verification and audits. The young people challenged me around 2014, 2015 to look at B Corp. And I was like, you know what? In my head, I thought that I was leading a great organization. But then when you go through those 3,000 questions these guys give you, <laughs> you're like, okay, there's a little bit of work to be done. So I, I, I encourage you strongly. I, I think that, um, and I, I stand firm with my opening statement, this is a prerequisite. You can trust the fair trade logo. You can trust the, the, the B Corp logo, but just be caution and ask more questions by these guys that are talking about, and I don't want to get in trouble because I'm on these boards with these guys. <laughs> oh, I, just be cautious about those uh, the guys that are just looking at the mirror and just looking at themselves. I agree. Yeah, and I would love you. to hear from either uh, Carlos or Abby, like how you mitigate risk even in your, um, in your process. So in my personal opinion, right? You, you should not be looking for just the message, sustainably made, organic, fair trade. As long as there is a label that's certified thing. Personally, because I work with directly fair trade farmers and the factory, and I go to other factories as well, um, I, I think they are okay, right? But there are a lot of people that are doing greenwashing, you know, fair, ways or fair labor, what does that mean? Who did their certification? Who certified that, right? Uh, in our case, from the farm itself, we know each and every farmer's name. We know uh, now, I mean, we pay only uh, through bank. You can even pay cash. So we know we, we uh, procure from them, right? Then it goes to the second phase, the ginning. We have our people sitting there. Right, so we, 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 we go all the way. So, but you know, you are right, a lot of people have that uh, thing. But I think 
be careful with those greenwashers who just say fair and organic, but they are not, you know, really certified, you know, and, and within itself, it can, nobody can be 100%, you know, but here at least you have this third certified people, auditors going to the farm and factories and interviewing and seeing how they practice. They do really do it. They do. I just want to add, I think yeah. trust is so interesting in today's world. Like, we get in strangers' cars with strangers. <laughs> um, and so I love those types of questions. I think as consumers, like, we have a responsibility to ask these questions. And so my recommendation is kind of twofold. One, like they're saying, go with third party verified. We have a lot of, you know, in house claims and, and programs. Um, and and so when you're looking at certification, look at ones that align with your values. The thing that drew me to fair trade, it's not just an audit, which is a snapshot in time, but the model of having workers elect a committee and having the financial mechanism, which is the carrot, workers know that if anything happens where they might lose their certification, they lose the financial mechanism as well, they act as the um, the audit body that happens every day in between their audits. And so they're holding their management to a set of standards. They're holding each other to a set of standards and responsibilities. Um, so look, look deeply in certification, get involved. Also look deeply at brands. Um, like Troy was saying, you know, look at what brands measure their success on and look at the brands that are doing the work, not just talking the talk. Thank you so much for that, Abby. Um, and I want to get to an, another question, uh, but we'll just say we there's also- We have a question also, right over here, think, right here. Yeah, I was, was just going to say, um, I think both uh, fair trade organizations also adhere to ICEAL. Um, and so ICEAL is the certifier of certifiers. They basically uphold standards that say, hey, these standards are doing um, what they are say they're in intending to do. So that, that's a good measure to look for with a certification organization if they're adhering to the, the ICEAL standards, I-S-E-A-L. <laughs> great, you're welcome. Thanks, really great, really, really great session. Um, so I work for a food manufacturer and we have been for nearly 20 years purchasing um, organic ingredients. About 80% of our ingredients are organic. And then we lean into certified sustainable ingredients where we can't go organic. My question specifically is for Abby or Carlos. Um, supply is always a challenge, right? It's availability of supply, especially as companies are growing and they want to really focus on their, their ingredients being sustainable and having those certifications. What at the farm level would you say are the one or two greatest challenges for farmers to achieve certification? Because also, we believe as a, as a food manufacturer, we have a responsibility to help them get that certification, to go through that transition. What can we be doing? What challenges should we be focusing on? I think I'll jump on that. Sure, so at, at Origin, the biggest challenges are, number one, that farmers are organized. When they're alone, it's very hard for them to have access to anything. They don't have access to finance. They don't have access to technical assistance. They don't have access to logistics, to storage, to anything, even market information. So just being part of a collective, being part of a, an established organization, that makes the work a million times easier, and it's still hard. Additional to this, you need capacity building for the producer organizations, and that's something that we can provide. Uh, through our producer networks, like I mentioned, close to 300 staff on the ground. We not only help producer organizations build capacity for certification, but also on improved agricultural practices, agroforestry, agroecological practices. You know, what we people call regenerative agriculture today, it's had several names in the past, but we've been doing it for years. So for us, it's, it's seamless. So I think you, you tapping into a system like fair trade that offers you traceability, transparency, integrity, um, like I said earlier, I think that the next step for you would be tap, you know, talk to, to, the, to the fair trade organizations. Um, what we can offer you is to tap into existing supply chains. If you've already, you know, been building loyalty and a relationship with producers, we understand that and we know how important that is so we can support them achieve certification as well. 
So I think that it's just a matter of like having a chat with the teams, assessing the supply chains, understanding your sustainability goals. And then based on that, we would put you in contact with FlowCert, which is the only um, third audit, audit um, assurance body that we work with, um, which is completely autonomous, um, but also integrated to the fair trade system. So we're able to capture data and provide valuable data back to the brands so that you know you can develop this the stronger relationships and work on the areas that need to be worked. So um, yeah, I would that would be the very next step. Thanks, Carlos. We are brushing up on time, and so I just want to check with our panelists if you and I don't whoever is in charge of this room because I'm not. Um, <laughs> if, if we can have five more minutes, uh, so we can get to another question, and yeah, Abby can answer. Yeah, Great, um, Abby, do you have anything to add to that, or do you want to pop to the next one? Great. Who is the next question? Let's go over here. Hi, um, I represent a company that offers climate solutions and we're talking about trust and educating consumers. If you aren't able to attend a session like this one, what are some ways that businesses can educate consumers in a way that's accessible and understood? Um, I, I think that there's a lot of pressure on consumers to take the time that's required to understand what a B Corp label is or what a fair trade label is, or what a carbon offset is. And so there's this jargon um, challenge that with bad actors that come out, now there's those that are doing the work and doing the right thing and you're kind of having to combat scrutiny. Um, what are some tips that you all have discovered that have helped empower those in a realistic way? Ooh, that's a deep question that we could have a whole session on. I'll um, keep it short by saying, you know, we, I think as it pertains to fair trade or any certification, the number one thing is help customers find it. It's the number one reason actually why fair, people don't buy fair trade, is they can't find it. You go to the coffee aisle, if you can't find a fair trade coffee, but you're out of coffee, you're still gonna buy one. So help them find it, and to help them deepen their understanding. And you can do that several ways. We know, you know, at Shelf, through signage, you have 20 seconds, um, through social media, but um, one of the powerful parts of being a fair trade business, a partner, is we have a series of campaigns that businesses can plug into so that we're telling a collective story. You're not just telling you know, the brand story of why fair trade's a value in your brand, which is so important, but we're bringing all of our fair trade brands together. Um, I also wanna plug uh, fair trade campaigns that we're all a part of. We, it's a grassroots movement um, of fair trade towns, cities, universities, and congregations who are consumers just like us, who are coming together to help you know, work with local government to lobby policies, um, to bring more fair trade products into campuses and universities, and to educate their neighbors and, and their congregations and universities on the power of their purchase decision. And so as a business, you also can get plugged in to those campaigns, LA is the largest fair trade city in the country and they're working towards a fair trade Olympics, which is amazing. And so look at, you know, look at the fair trade campaigns network and see where you might plug in to, to be in community with other advocates and to help leverage those channels to, to educate. And I know for B Lab and B Corp, we have a series of campaigns that we do throughout the year to, uh, you know, share what, what is a B Corp. Um, and on the back end of that, what's important with the community building is um, our community team has created some incredible collab sessions where B Corps can come together and share their storytelling campaigns. So not everyone has a full-fledged marketing department, um, but everybody has good ideas that they can come together on and um, look to the folks who, again, have been sharing that story and doing the, the brand education for a while. Um, but then also come into that community of practice. So look for those opportunities to connect with other companies who are doing the, the storytelling and up on that, that shared narrative um, and maybe even combine some, some marketing dollars as well. Yeah, yeah. So quickly, I think if you have a really good story, uh, a lot of media, they want to write because they need some good story to write, right? 
for Gallant, it worked because we've been in Forbes and Newsweek and Insider, they all came to us, we didn't go to them because we have a story, right? Then all those consumers, they are reading those magazines or newspapers or watching that. So, you know, that's why I said, like, if you have a really true story, I think it goes faster with less investment. And that's why I was suggesting, even I said, you know, my customers are Facebook, Google, but you do the story rather than those things. That's my personal uh, experience. Thanks, Vic. We will take one more question. And thank, thank you. And thank you all for being here and for the, this so, panel. You're, uh, we'll take two more questions, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your passion is... Uh, yeah, this question is about... Sorry, sorry uh, I think we have somebody starting a question over here, and we will have, give you the last question, if that's all right. If you could use the microphone just in case somebody is, is having trouble hearing, that would be great. Sorry, it wasn't working. Thanks um, so much. I'll hold it at a distance. Thank you. And uh, your passion is very heavy, and I can, we can feel it, and it's relatable. Um, my question is in, in regards to the audits and recognizing that each link in the supply chain is very vital, most especially the farmers. How, how do you account for let's say micro lots, not industrial farms, but micro lots that may have accounts with several buyers, with several brands, and they could be fair trade, but they still have to move their product and they have to sell and they could have many buyers that can't afford the fair trade price. So I've been learning recently about coffee farms that are fair trade, they, move, they have product that's fair trade, but then they sell maybe 60% of their fair trade product off fair trade market. Mm -hmm. And so they're not necessarily making the, um, they're not bringing in that, that revenue for their farm and their farmers that, that fair trade sh would, I guess that we would hope that it would create. Mm -hmm. I can. Yeah, um, yeah, like Abby had said earlier, that, that's, that just happens and that, that's due to the demand. There's not enough demand for the supply of fair trade raw materials. So that's the work that we're doing here, you know, in the U.S., uh, creating uh, greater awareness, making connections. You know, we, we do things like at mural campaigns here with, with cooperatives and supermarkets so that it connects farmers to the consumer here. We try to bring producers and consumer together to pay a better price. But this only happens if there's demand. And the U.S. consumer is not there yet where we have enough influence on retailers and on companies to buy fair trade. So I think it's up to them. I think it's up to the stakeholders that make the important decisions, importers, traders, retailers, uh, advocacy groups, to really create a pressure and a mechanism that really generates that urgency to, to, have, to have a greater demand. But as far as transaction costs throughout the supply chain, I think there's, we have digital systems that allow us to have integrity and traceability. We're constantly evolving these and developing them, such as like fair trace and then others that help us uh, see the tra transparency of how much it's paid from the, from the contract to the producers, also how the premium is utilized by the farmers, all of these we have mechanisms in place and then Flo FlowCert verifies these and provides the assurance. Um, so I think that I, hopefully I, I answered your question. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, you know, we're being market-led, um, farmer-focused, we're only going to be able to be successful as the amount of products that we sell on fair trade terms. That's how we drive premium back to producers, that's the financial mechanism that keeps producers and workers and fishers in the program. Um, and so we're constantly looking at, you know, what, what can the market bear? That's why when you think about the cost of fair trade, it's so complex, right? We have some commodities that have a minimum price, some that don't, the premium's different based on if you're you know, a tomato or a banana or because it's all market-based. It's what can the market bear um, what are consumers willing to pay, but also what's enough to be that financial mechanism and drive actual real change and long-term outcomes with producers. So we are constantly looking at premium, minimum price, and every cost um, throughout the supply chain trying to ensure that 
that market can bear that price and that it's enough to be meaningful for producers. Thank you so much, Abby and Carlos. Um, let's get this one final question, and it's going to be a great one. I just know it. <laughs> If we need to end, I can get with a couple of folks offline. I'll leave that to you. Um, this is about the business case. Now, I heard a couple of comments there uh, about the business case, and you all have obviously been working in this for a while and have seen it, as my interpretation, really through the system, right? You started your own business. Troy's been in, uh, in corporate America. I get the high-level business case, right? We're going to do some good for the world, and it's market-driven by some generations. But what are two or three of the aha moments you had inside the business case, right? Sort of looking inside and out that we don't necessarily see um, that, that caused you to say, wow, didn't understand that, but that's really quite a driver or very significant. Troy or Vic, do you want to? Yeah, and could, I just want to add, because I'm really excited about this one. Um, we recently ran a pilot with the largest retailer in the world, um, specifically to their Mexican tomatoes. And, um, you know, some of the results that we saw around worker retention, um, but also waste, because what we learned was that there are workers that are not just picking tomatoes, but they're putting the seal on those tomatoes. And so, you know, the waste decreased and we looked into it and they saw, well, the workers said, we know that we're getting a premium for this product. So we're picking the best quality product to put the seal on. And so um, that coupled with their results around um, employee sentiment and satisfaction also increasing. I mean, those are amazing intangible that come with the business case that were really surprising to us. Anyone else have a business well, case? I mean, for me, I think the growth that I'm seeing and uh, uh, the brands and all, you know, different um, corporates and all trusting, um, you know, B Corp certified companies and fair trade certified companies. I didn't expect, as I said, I, it's, it's in my wildest dream, I didn't think that, right? Um, and like, what makes me happy? 99% retention rate, right? Then when I go to India and I sit with farmers and I ask, they practice um, organic farming and I ask, like, you know, tell us what kind of diseases you have here? I mean, I couldn't believe they have little, right? They are roaming there, but they have no diseases. And here, like, we have cancers and blood pressure and, you know, what not. The only, I found two people, they had liver problem because they drank too much, <laughs> right? <laughs> other, than, other than that, they are healthy because, you know, they are with nature every day, right? Uh, so that, that was really, you know, like, it's unbelievable, you know, like in a business it's hard, you know, you sleep only four hours, especially when you are a small business. But seeing those and, you know, them practicing organic and having not only that, not only fair price, long-term commitment, but also good health, you see, they're not exposed. And other thing that really wowed me was, I asked him, why do you do this? He says, the soil is, is the God and Mother Earth. We pray, it gives everything to us, right? And we are proud that we are not putting chemicals in this and, uh, you know, growing this without, you know, any chemicals and hurting our family in the land. That's the person who has no education. You know, they are, they are the healers. In fact, we are the, you know, I mean, believe me, still there is a lot of, you know, emission we do, but they are not, they are the healers. So that, that's what, that was the wow moment for me, like no disease. and caring and loving that land. Yeah, thank you. Give a round of applause for that. <laughs> wow, I wish we had like an hour more for questions because um, there's so much brilliance sitting on this stage. Um, and I know that there are going to be more opportunities to talk to each of these folks uh, throughout the rest of the day and the retreat. Um, so one, I want to thank you all for joining us, both fair trade organizations, um, Gallant and Divine Chocolate. 
Um, I also want to say uh, Vic will be speaking in an afternoon session, I believe, right, on regenerative agriculture, um, if you're interested in hearing more about that. Uh, and then all of the ways we talked about to support the fair trade movement, um, whether that's as an individual or following that curiosity to see how to integrate fair trade um, certification into your product um, or use already fair trade materials or work with those factories. Um, go to uh, what websites can folks go to for each fair trade organization? It's fairtradeamerica.org and, and fairtradecertified.org. You got it. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. I think that closes us out. Thank you, everyone on the live stream. Wave again to those folks. We're happy to have you with us um, and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>